Stokes. Hit well. Oh, he's there. Stokes has put Southampton in the lead. A great break there for Southampton. And they're all on that Southampton bench. Gets you out to this near flank. And a back cross back. A minute to play. Here's Letizia. Who better to say farewell? Welcome to the latest episode of Total Recall, which sees me, Will Dorr from Saints Archive, joined by my archive colleague and sidekick, Leon Burton, and Ben to chat with yet another ex Saint. This time out, we're delighted to welcome a true club legend. Having played over 800 games for Saints and scoring 187 goals, putting him fourth in all-time goal-scoring list at time of recording. If this record isn't impressive enough on its own, he was also part of England's famous 1966 World Cup winning squad. He's the proud owner of an MBE, equally as proudly, I'm sure, is currently honorary president for our beloved club. It is, of course, Terry Payne, MBE. Terry, on behalf of the three of us, we're truly honoured to have you with us tonight on Total Recall. That's very kind, yeah. Thank you very much. Now fire away. Okay, so we'll get things uh, starting here, Terry. Of course, born in Winchester and after leaving school, went to work in Eastleigh for British Rail during the mid-1950s. Whilst doing that, you started your footballing career with Winchester City. During your time with Winchester City, you also had a trial at Arsenal Football Club. In one of your uh, trials uh, matches, you actually scored twice. And while the Gunners were potentially mulling over a more formal move, Ted Bates was alerted to your ability by Winchester City manager and former Saints player Harry Osman. Is that right? Well, it is right, but at the same time, the guy from the uh, from the body works where I worked at Eastley, John Wall was his name. He he actually phoned Ted and alerted him to the fact that I'd gone to Arsenal. So the combination of Johnny Wall, which I know he's got a letter, where his son has got the letter from Ted thanking him. And, of course, Harry Oseman, as you quite rightly said, uh, an outside left for Southampton and uh, obviously knew Ted very well. Um, but I have to say also, which isn't often known, uh, that I did have a trial for Portsmouth as well, uh, which uh, I never heard anything after. Uh, and then off to Arsenal, I went twice. In fact, Jack Crayston, who was the assistant manager at Arsenal then under uh, the great Tom Whitaker, um, he became manager, I think it was, of Doncaster. And it was when we were playing Doncaster at the Dow that I saw him at the um, at the Royal Hotel, I think it was called at the time. And uh, he stopped me and said, Terry, I'd just like to tell you, the secretary mucked up the, uh, the forms and he should have sent you them, and he never. And consequently, you know, signing for Southampton prior to them, supposedly have to send off the forms to me to sign for Arsenal. So there we go. That was the sort of, um, that was how it, how it all happened. And uh, alongside, of course, another mate of mine from Winchester, Colin Holmes, who also worked in the body shop with me. We were long-time friends at Winchester and uh, played cricket together with the Hyde Ramblers. He was in the office with me with Ted, but he was going to sign the forms as well. And uh, although we both sort of hesitated, what I did anyhow, but the trouble was we got in there about two o'clock and come about half past four, we were still talking and chatting. You know, we were both getting very hungry, so we wanted to go home and have our tea. So, and, but Ted had already locked the, locked the door to, to his office. We couldn't get out. So rather than starve, we signed the form. <laughs> so, Terry, and, um, you signed... Um in August 1956 on amateur forms. Terry's a local Hampshire lad. How did it feel with signing with Ted and what sort of strategy was he looking at to develop you and progress within the club? Well, the strategy really was already formed. He was the first to bring the youth team on board as such. Um, CPC Sports, under Mr. Henwood, who owned the, who owned the company, he actually ran the youth uh, system for Ted. And um, we... Although I didn't play for CPC because I was playing for Winchester City, um, that was how it all started. And that youth team uh, took us all the way through to the semi-finals of the Youth Cup. And um, probably there was about 17 of us in that squad. Of that 17, 12 turned professional. It was a remarkable turnaround for the club that they could have basically 12 local lads turn professional 
And the number of those went on, of course, to make uh, 13 debuts as well. So really, that was the foundations of, of what it was all about and where Ted was going and what he was going to do. He was going to introduce a lot of young blood and local blood and turn over the team as such. And um, I can't remember exactly what year it was, but it, he put 14 or 15 players on the transfer list at the end of the season. What happened was that you'd knock the door, go in, and he'd either say to you, I'm, you, you were getting a transfer, I'm letting you go, or he'd give you an envelope saying that you were retained for the following season. You have to remember there is no freedom of contract. So once you'd sign for the club, if they wanted to keep hold of you until you were 80 years of age at that time, mm-hmm. you, you know, you, you'd have still been a, a Southampton player. You, you just, there was no freedom of contract, simple as that. Of course, at that time, you're still very young. Um, what role did your family play in everything that was going on? I just imagine it's quite a bit of a roller coaster to that initial period of joining Saints. Well, obviously, Ted came, came to my home to meet my mum and dad. And my dad was adamant that I would have a trade, you know. Typical, he worked at British Railways as well and did so for 40 odd years. And um, he was insistent that I got a trade. I mean, that was the big sticking point. Mum wasn't particularly worried. In actual fact, I don't think mum ever come to see me play. My dad came to see all the games. But um, where, where he sort of persuaded dad was to say, no, no, he transfer from the Eastley Carriage Works, my indentures, as they were called, he transferred them to CPC, that I could carry on a trade there. Well, between you and I, I never stuck foot inside a CPC. When I was called up for the army, I didn't even know where the address was. I couldn't put it down on the form. So I never actually did anything as far as the trade was concerned. All I did was play football. So at that time, the progress was quite rapid for you. And just six months later, just had your 18th birthday, you signed um, professional terms for Saints. And your rise was pretty swift at that time, wasn't it? You made your three consecutive debuts in that month, Terry. Um, first of all, for the A-team, then a couple of weeks later for the reserves. And then all of a sudden, you're making your debut for the first team against Brentford. And you're still age 17 then. Division 3 South, I think it was at the time. And that was a three-all draw at Dow, I believe. Terry, what's that like to make your senior debut? And can you remember what Ted said to you on the day of the game? Well, you're quite right. I mean, the A game under Bill Ellington, I think it was, uh, was um, over at Cowes on the other right. I think the reserve game was against Bristol Rovers, I think it was. And then I was still working then, by the way, and I got a phone call or I had to phone Ted on the Friday to see what was happening on the weekend and where I was playing. And he said, uh, you'll be in the first team and you'll be playing against Brentford. Uh, first thing I said, you know, really, I, I suppose by then I was quite bush about my own ability. I said, oh, OK, but who's playing inside forward? So he said, well, Johnny Walker. Well, Johnny Walker, as you know, was a, was an old pro, a great old pro, went on to play for Wolves as as well as Southampton, and uh, was a good inspiration, a, a great player to, to have, as we call then, inside forwards. So, and that was it, as you quite rightly said, Brentford up the Dow 3-3. Uh, the right back was called Wally Bragg, and um, I did okay, but of course I started on the left wing. I didn't start on the right wing. So my debut was on the left wing, as it was against Aldershot, as you quite rightly said. And my next game, um, you know, after the Brentford game, on my 18th birthday, was at Aldershot where uh, I scored the goal. So it was my 18th birthday and I scored the first goal for Southampton as well. So that's how it all began. And, um, you know, it carried on to the end of that season, which I think I, I played about 10 games, I think, the remainder of that season. Just before Leon asks you about that 18th birthday and your goal, Terry, when uh, we were lucky enough to have Eric uh, on a, a couple of weeks back, Eric Martin, and uh, he uh, mentioned at the time that the first time he met Ted Bates, it was clear how much Ted loved football, he loved watching it, talking about it, playing it, etc., etc. What were your sort of <laughs> memories of uh, Ted as a manager, Terry? Well, Eric summed it up exactly well. There was, there was no other thing in Ted Bates like far, far football. I mean, um, you know, he lived it, he breathed it, he... It was his life, and he dedicated that life, as, you, as you're well aware, to Southampton Football Club. And he was always there encouraging. What it was like in those days, as far as that was concerned, was that you had a chance. 
In other words, it's not like probably it is today. You come on the scene. If you don't make it in the first few games, you, you know, you may not make it again. It was a case of being in the third division and giving you time to develop, I think. And, and then him having the trust in you, I think that's what all managers like about players, that they can trust them. And I think the farther it went, obviously, the more trust he had in me and the more I appreciated that he did have that. So that was how it all began. You felt that he, he really wanted you. He really wanted you in the team and, and to be part of what he was trying to do. After your debut, Terry, um, your first goal wasn't far away, oh, there was it, up at Old Shot, and that was on your 18th birthday. That must have been some present for you. What do you remember that goal, Terry, and how did it feel to get off that mark at the time? Yeah, well, I can't remember if it was first half or second half, but it, I remember covering him from the, uh, the byline. I remember it well, actually, and uh, the keepers just moved off his line thinking I was going to cross it, and I hit it inside him, inside the near post, into the net. Um, I'll be honest with you, I can't remember if we won that game or we drew it, uh, but I, I know there was only one goal in it which I scored, and uh, like any other time scoring goals, you know, your first goal, you always remember it, and um, and you just hope that there's more to come, obviously, and the same, you know, when you score for your national team, you always remember your first goal. Obviously, you're predominant position um, in your younger years, you would be a, a winger. But of those who weren't blessed to watch you play, Terry, what were some of your key strengths and what made you such a formidable player for Saints? Like everything, Ted Bates always said, play to your strengths. You know, that was his motto. You know, don't, don't worry so much about your weaknesses, but just play to your strengths. And, you know, if those strengths were good enough, they're always going to get you through. You know, what I had was a, was a good perception of what was going on around me. I always had that. I always had a picture before I received the ball of what was going on. I think that was one of my biggest assets. And the other asset, of course, or the two of them really, was that, um, you know, I could pick a pass. Uh, I could be very accurate with my passing. And the other asset I had, of course, was that uh, I was two-footed. Although my right foot was always my best foot, I you know, certainly scored enough goals with my left foot. But it was the perception that I had, the picture that I'd already took as if I'd had a camera, that I knew what was going on around me. I think George, George O'Brien summed it up best in, in some ways. I remember he saw a comment about me. He said, it, it, when I played the game, it was just like, like I was playing in the stands, you know, that I knew where everywhere it was, where everything was on, what angles there were, what positions players were in. And um, during my career, obviously, I built up that like telepathy with a lot of the players I played with. And um, really, that was my strength. You know, I I wasn't quick in the sense that I was a speed bird and I was sharp. But where I was sharp and where I got a lot of my my success was, was um, I had a very quick brain. You know, what we call a football brain, if you like. And I had a very good one that I knew, as I said, what was going on around me. And um, that stuck with me throughout my career. You'd go on to play over 800 games for Saints, more than anyone else has ever done, and in just 17 years, Terry. Now, I'm not much of a mathematician, but the calculator tells me that that's an average of circa 47 games a season. Not only that, but you also went on a record seven seasons as an ever-present. In fact, as I think you've mentioned before, the only Saints matches you tended to miss during that period were for international duty, as England often played their games on Saturdays. It's a truly jaw-dropping record, especially given that that was in an era when pitches were maybe mixed in quality and players could essentially hack each other a bit more than they do these days. So how did you keep yourself so available? Was it more luck than judgment, or did you work really hard on sort of being as tough and fit as possible, Terry? I think it was a little bit of a combination of everything. In those days, it wasn't so much a squad. I mean, it was one of those situations, if you won one week, you knew you'd be picked the next. It was, mm. it, it, there wasn't a rotation like it was today. And uh, I think, as I said before, you know, being able to keep out of trouble physically um, you had to be particularly sharp, which which obviously I did. Of course, I had to have huge slice of luck, mm. which everybody needs, and I certainly had my fair amount of them. You're quite right. You said games I missed invariably were because of international call-up when you used to play on a Saturday. And the other thing was I was very much injury-free, so that went a long way. And um, the fact that I was available pretty well every week. The only other sort of little blip on the record was the fact that I got suspended a couple of times. Uh, so I missed a game here and there. 
Otherwise, it was, uh, as you quite rightly said, I'm, I'm quite proud of that record of, of going seven seasons, you know, without missing a game. I mean, I think, you know, attitude goes a long way in, in how you set yourself up for games. And I think it was Mike Langley who used to write for the people at one time, said uh, the reason that Terry Payne, you know, played so many games was that he was always available unless he had a broken leg or, or a broken skull. So <laughs> got to remember also, we never had that medical help that they, they get nowadays. Um, we did, we had good old Jim Gallagher was the trainer plus the physio and, and uh, lovely, lovely man who uh, looked after us the best he could. I, I don't think he was a qualified physio by any means. But so that's how it was in those days. So I think, I think having a very strong attitude at, you know, a mental attitude went, went a long way and a lot of luck as far as injuries were concerned. Yeah, he literally had a cold bucket of water and a sponge and that was it, right? Well, if Kim ran on the field with a cold bucket and sponge, I told you I used to get up <laughs> <laughs> during the winter particularly. The last thing I wanted was to be based with cold water, that's for sure. <laughs> no, absolutely. Uh, look, were there any particular opposition players that you knew always tried to sort of target you because of your trickery and goals? I think everybody at that day, they all had their hard men. I mean, that, the game was, as you, as you well know, was a lot more physical than it is today. Um, you know, I used to say any tackle below the chest was, a, was allowed. So, but there was, there was loads of us, you know, there was Chopper Harris, mm. you know, a, a little bit later there was um, Norman Boyton Leg Hunter who just sadly just passed away. But everybody had a hard man. We had the hardest man of the lot, of course. We had Cliff Huxford. <laughs> he was absolutely brilliant for the team and, and the way he went about it and his will to win was tremendous and his tackling was was really ferocious. We had David Walker, and of course we had the great Dennis Hollywood who used to love to mix it with people. Mm. So we all had a hard man, you know, and you knew who you were and you knew who was going to try and take you out as well. I had big Roy Lannister at Portsmouth, didn't I? We had some great battles. I remember kicking him in the thigh one day, going over the top, kicking him in the thigh. He lifted his thigh and I went over his head. <laughs> you know, so great battles in those days. It was give and take and you know, I was a winger that, that I could certainly give it, maybe a little bit slyer than most, but I certainly used to leave my foot in. And I don't see why not either, because, you know, we were getting kicked into the stands every Saturday if they had the opportunity. So I didn't see what was wrong with us giving a little bit back as well. Mm. And, uh, yeah, you mentioned Cliff there, because it wasn't just opposition players that were sometimes out to get you, was it? Tell us the story about when you nutmegged uh, Cliff in uh, training in the car park on Christmas Day, wasn't it? Yeah, Christmas greeting from, from Cliff that morning on the car park, snow on the ground, little six aside. I don't know how it happened because I always made sure that I was on Cliff's side. So I don't know what happened there. Maybe a bit of Christmas cheer, I'm not sure. But then I nutmegged him and he punched me on the jaw. I said, don't you ever do that again, which of course I never did. <laughs> yeah, what about those um, teammates, Terry? Uh, no doubt there's some wonderful players you shared the change room with. Eric told us the other week that Laz called you little Elvis. You must have had some great memories from some of them, mustn't you? Have you got any stories or anecdotes um, sticking in mind? Regarding the dressing rooms, you've got to remember when I started, you know, there were some real crazy old pros that were in, in that dressing room. Actually, one of them who really looked after me when I first started was Don Roper who, of course, had, had started, I think, started at St. Anthony, had gone to Arsenal and, and was a great player for Arsenal, a great left-footed player. He, he was like, a, a, as you like, a father figure to me as far as, uh, as far as the senior players were concerned. But we had so many great players. We had people like Big Bob Charles, who came through the youth. He was a goalkeeper. And one week, we had the Harlem Globetrotters were coming. You know, the great American basketball team. Anyhow, Bob was helping them unload the flooring. Well, a bit of the flooring fell, and it trapped his ankle on the, on the floor. So they all ran to get Jim Gallagher. So Jim Gallagher come running out, you know, to, to help Bob. He was trapped under this wooden floor. And he said, Bob, Bob, he said, what could I get you? <laughs> Bob said, I, I want a donut. <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, uh, uh, the dressing rooms were full of them in the training training sessions and, and obviously match days. But, you know, just generally, I always say professional footballers to be great people, great great people to get on with. This brings on to one player which we haven't spoke about yet. Sadly, no longer with us was the great Ron Davis, wasn't it? Any memories of playing as Ron? And how did you rate him at that time, yeah. Terry? 
Well, I mean, you're talking about possibly the greatest centre forward that Salanta's ever had. Absolutely majestic in, in the air. I mean, people said I used to put it on his head, but goodness me, you know, any cross that came in, you knew that Ron was going to be on the end of them. It was absolutely a brilliant, brilliant centre forward. And we were so lucky to, to have him. Ted Bates had done such a great business to get him from Norwich and bring him into the team. And, and he absolutely thrived on, on the crosses from both sides, John Sidney on the left and himself on the right. And others, of course, you know, but he, he was absolutely brilliant. He was strong. He, he used to train hard. Um, he was just an outstanding, outstanding centre forward who, as we know, scored so many goals for them, so many great goals. And on a couple of seasons, really, it was his goals that kept us in, in the league in the first division as it was at the, those days. And, you know, I can't speak highly of him. Sadly, you know, you, you get, get images of, of players and I thought Ron Davis would go on forever. He was, he was that much of a, you know, an icon as far as we were concerned and certainly as I was concerned. And we, we had a reputation of, you know, me being able to lay it in there and him being able to finish it off. Absolutely brilliant. I can't speak highly enough of him. He, he was absolutely, well, must have been the top centre forward in Europe at the time. I think Matt Busby actually said that. I think Matt Busby said he, he was the best centre forward in, in, in Europe. And, uh, of course, it, he, he never moved in his prime when he left Southampton. He, he was sort of just beginning to come at the end. And when he eventually went to Man United, of course, they certainly didn't see the best of him there. But uh, they were determined to get him. And eventually, that, that's what happened. But can't speak highly enough of him. I mean, absolutely brilliant, brilliant guy. Mm. Yeah, I'll, I'll quite agree there, Terry. Um, as Will said earlier, played over 800 times for Saints. Um, can you think of any games that come to the forefront of your mind? And can you pick out any favourites of those games? Well, I suppose, you know, like everything else, I mean, plenty of memories. I mean, when you've played 800 odd times, there are plenty of moments in games that you, you appreciate. I think there's two or three that stand out. The first one is not a, not a league game, it's an FA Cup tie. We were in the third division, and we have to travel to the might of Manchester City at Main Road, who were a well-established first division side in those days. Burke Troutman, the great goalkeeper, was in goal. And we went there as a third division. And uh, I could always remember Bob Charles saying, Christ, I hope they don't get a netball score here today against us. That was, you know, they, hey, they were sort of looked on in those days being a, you know, a well-established first division side. Anyhow, to cut a long story short, we won 5-1. I mean, imagine that, a third division now going to Manchester City and winning 5-1. I mean, it was unheard of. I still, I still think, it, certainly in my time, was the greatest you know, FA Cup win probably in Southampton's history. I mean, and I'm not taking anything away from the fabulous run they had to win the FA Cup, which is obviously the biggest moment. But from talking about a cup tie on its own, that really stood out for me. And that summer... Manchester City were knocking on my door, um, asking if I'd put in for a transfer so that they could buy me. We all had outstanding games that day, and Derek Rees, I'm not sure if he got a hat trick, or uh, I think he might have got a hat trick, and George O'Brien probably got two as well. Uh, but we really steamrolled them. We won the league that year, I think it was 59, 60, and I think we won the league that year as well. We, we were a, a blooming good third division side, uh, but to go there, that, that was exceptional. And the other one is a league game. It's part of the Southampton's history. Of course, late in Orient, 1966. Uh, I scored with one of those rare headers that uh, got us the draw that pretty well put us up. I mean, we, we had to lose to Manchester City 6-0 uh, not to achieve that. But so that was very memorable. And to score, and we went to Manchester City and drew near nil uh, the last game. So, so that was well taken care of. But the fact that I scored that goal, which was the last in the second division, as it was then, and blow me, if we didn't get drawn at home against Manchester City, I scored the first goal in the first division for the club, ever for the club. So the last one and the first one. So that always stands out as a memory in the game against Manchester City, uh, the first game of that season when we were newly promoted. So, you know, those three, among many, many others, obviously, Hat tricks has got a couple of hat tricks as well. They always stand out. But those three games, you know, Man City away, late night away, Man City home, they stand out. And, and a bit of history as well. 
you totally stolen my thunder because we were going to ask you about that one, uh, the May 1966 uh, game, Terry. But just in terms of that, sort of ad-libbing the question then, obviously, uh, you know, a quick look at the table says that finished one point ahead of Coventry. So it was obviously quite a close run promotion race in Division 2. So getting across the line as a team must have been really rewarding. Yeah, brilliant. I mean, it's great. I mean, obviously, it's fabulous for the sort of the supporters and, and the, the directors of the club. I mean, the directors of the club there wouldn't be your mates, but you knew them all. I knew every director. I chats with them. I had a drink with them. I travelled with us. It was brilliant. It was a family. It was really outstanding. And of course, what what made it extra special for Ted Bates was the fact that I think he was in the team that failed to get promotion when they were, I don't know, what they, six, eight points clear mm. back in 48, 49, whatever it was, and the whole city saying, ah, they didn't want to go up. But, of course, we all know that Charlie Wayne and that great Southampton set of forward, who had the pleasure of beating two or three times, um, he was injured, and that took away a lot of their, their goal scoring. So, you know, for Ted Bates to be able to come from that situation and take us into the first division, it was... Um, it was something very special for him as well. Although I've got to tell you that in the dressing room afterwards, when we were all drinking champagne, he said to me, he said, Terry, I've got, he said, I've got a glass of champagne, but he said, I'm not celebrating yet. So he was still worried and thinking about the Manchester City game that was to come. <laughs> and I can see Martin Shivers finished top goalscorer that season in that league with 30 goals. But uh, there we go. Um, look, before we go on to talk about England and the amazing summer that followed in 1966 for you, you'd eventually leave Saints later on in 1974, having spent many happy years at the Dow. Was it a surprise to leave the club? And how hard was it for you personally to move on after you know 800 plus games, Terry? I think the problem is, Ben, is that being there so long, you almost think you're part of the furniture. Mm. And it's proven that, you know, that's not the case. I mean, things move on, you know, now you, now you realise that. And when I look back, I realise that, that I wasn't going to be there forever. Although at the time, I probably thought I was. Obviously, it came as a, a, as a surprise to me, although we had got relegated. Mm. And um, obviously, there, there were... You know, there were things that were going on with the new manager, which was Larry, Larry McManamy, and obviously he he was looking to the future. And I suppose I should have been looking to the coaching side as well. Mm. But, I, you know, I thought I was still playing OK and I could still play. So to be given a free transfer, yeah, was a big surprise. But as they say, one, you know, door closes, a window opens, and John Shinnick got the job at Hereford. And when I phoned to congratulate him, he said, Christ, I wish I could get you. And I said, well... I can. I said, I can come. I said, I got a free transfer. He nearly dropped the phone. <laughs> you know, he couldn't believe it. So that's how it happened, really. It was a, a case of 18 years. is a long, long time to be in a club as a player. Mm. And the only other move, basically, was to go on the coaching side. Realistically, now I look back. But, of course, you still think you can do it. And I suppose up to a point I proved that. I went on to Hereford, of course, this player coach, played another 111 games and uh, got promotion mm. from a little farming area that we went to, Hereford, was the most famous thing about Hereford was the Hereford Bull. Yeah. And then to go on and get promotion and play sides like Chelsea and out of Edgar Street, I mean, was, was really a, a remarkable, a remarkable achievement. As good as an achievement I've had in football, I think, to go there with John Sinnott as the manager, who did an absolutely brilliant job. So... So that was that was the end of my career there. But the, you know, there was a, another step forward, another opening to to carry on, and, uh, and I took it. And of course, look, it wasn't long until you did actually get a chance to return as well, because in October of 1976, after the Saints had won the FA Cup, you were now, as you say, playing as player coach for Hereford, visited the Dow, albeit Saints winning 1-0. Um, Glenn Delacour, who regularly appears on our weekly podcast, Terry, told me that he remembered seeing you play in that game, but was only about eight years old. Glenn remembers asking his dad what the Guard of Honour was for, but his dad not being able to say much because he was so emotional. <laughs> it must have been some experience for you to be treated with the sort of respect and adulation that of course you deserved but what do you remember that day Terry the guard of honour the atmosphere because it must have been emotional for you as well it was very very emotional and yet in my heart I don't think I should have played mm. you know my heart you know would always be with Salanta although however we're paying my wages they were obviously you know we were trying to battle our way in, in the second division and we were up against it there. We didn't quite have the quality that we needed. We had no money to spend. But I've got to be honest, I never enjoyed the game itself. I enjoyed the atmosphere. I enjoyed the reception. 
it was overwhelming. Uh, but the game itself, I didn't have the heart for it, to be honest with you. It was as simple as that. And uh, although it was a wonderful occasion to be, to be recognised in that manner, uh, I didn't enjoy the game at all. I enjoyed the game at Edgar Street, which we won 2-1. <laughs> I wasn't going to mention that <laughs> Against one. Against <yeah>. Southampton. <laughs> okay, moving on briefly to talk about England then. You made your debut for the national side in 1963, aged just 24, as England beat Czechoslovakia 4-2. That must have been some moment for you and your family. What it showed me was, Alf Ramsey, as you know, then was the, the newest manager for, for England. He was looking forward to 66, obviously. And when I went on, you know, when I played, I mean, Czechoslovakia were a really good side. I think the year before they got to the semi-final of the World Cup, some really outstanding players. So to go there and be part of that and to win 4-2 uh, was, was really, you know, an eye-opener for me. And I always believe that Alf Ramsey had picked me not just on one performance, but on a performance when he brought his ever-conquering Ipswich side to Southampton in a cup tie. I think it was a cup tie. may have been the league. I'm not sure. Anyway, I think we beat them 7-0. I scored a couple of goals that day. And um, I, I believe that opened his eyes a little bit to when he got the England job. That he, I think Alf always liked goal-scoring wingers. And, uh, you know, he, when you have a look at the sides that he picked, he, invariably players that he picked could score goals. You know, I'm talking about proper wingers now, wide players, you know. And so, you know, I think in, in many ways that performance then might have just given the nod as far as my ability. And obviously he came to watch me a few times as well. But to be selected to go on that tour was, was absolutely brilliant. And then to make the debut and then to win 4-2, you couldn't ask for anything better. Later that year, Terry, you'd gone to score a hat-trick at Wembley against Northern Ireland, becoming first winger to score three goals for England since the late and great Stanley Matthews in 1937. England were, of course, managed by another ex-Saint then, Sir Alf Ramsey. What was it like as Terry to work alongside Sir Alf? Well, he, he was quite a quiet man in many ways, very reserved, but he loved England. I mean, he was a true English gentleman, and, uh, and that's how he, he came over to you. But he, but he was one of those managers that would just step up alongside you during a practice game or when you, whatever you were doing in the practice sessions and have a quiet word in your ear. He was that kind of player made it very clear what he expected from you, what he expected you to do. So you always had a clear picture of what England was about. He certainly got across, got that across to me at times. I remember once he, he sidled up to me and he says, um, Terry, he says, uh, I think you're looking for Jimmy Greaves a little bit too much. <laughs> 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 so, you know, I, Jimmy was playing then inside forward. I think our record stands out for England to be, Goal-wise, seemed to be pretty good. So, um, you know, but that was that was the kind of thing you'd do. It's sort of just jog your memory and uh, just plant a little seed. And, and that's how he was. But he, otherwise, he was, he was pretty well straightforward. But as I said, loved England, was a, was a typical English gentleman in, in many, many ways. And a dry sense of humour as well. By the time the 1966 World Cup in England came along, you were an established member of Ramsey's squad and were included in his final 22. What was it like to be playing in a World Cup in your home nation, especially given the journey would eventually go on to win it? Well, that was, you know, obviously to be one of the 22 was, was you know, the highlight, really, of, of my international career. I remember we were all at Liddershaw. We'd been away on a tour. I think Poland had been one of those teams we'd, we'd played away from home. We came home. We, went to, we had a day off. We went to Liddershaw, obviously, to prepare for the World Cup. And I think there was something like 27 players who actually went. And then of that 27, he had to pick 22. And on the final day, the day that we were due to leave, he was going to tell the 22. But what he had to do first was tell the five that hadn't made it, which was really heartbreaking. And you just fingers crossed that, you know, the call didn't come to say that Alf wanted to see you. And fortunately for me, that call never came. And as you quite rightly said, I was a member of that 22 squad, which is uh, really so thrilling for me. And I think what people have to remember, you know, and not many people picked this up, that I was only a second division player. I'd never played in the first division. So when they say you have to step up from your club football playing in the first division to play internationally, I had to make two steps up because I was playing in the second division. Although we'd got promotion in 66, all my games 
I played for England was a second division player. So that just tells you the, the, the uh, trust that he had in me. That though I was a second division player, I was still good enough to play for England. And um, I went on to play 19 times, of course, and scored my first goal against probably the greatest side that's ever been seen at Wembley in terms of selection. That was against the World Eleven, October 23rd, 1963. Never forget it. Uh, some some of the greatest players that ever, you know, walked the walked the playing field were on that uh, pitch that day at Wembley. Di Stefano, Gento, and uh, and Puskas and company, Snellinger, Yashin, the big tall goalkeeper from Russia, uh, Delmo Santos, the right back of Brazil. There were many, you know, many great. Dennis Law from Man United played brilliant, scored the goal for the rest of the world. But I opened the scoring. I opened the score in about the 67th minute, something like that. Mm. Stuck it in with my left foot when it came back to me off of uh, Jimmy Greaves' toe. And I stuck that away. So that was my first goal for England. And Alf's uh, comments after he came in, he always shook hands with all the players, win or lose, after the game, to thank you. And he came to me, shook me hand and said, uh, scoring goals as well now, eh? <laughs> it was uh, very, very nice. Uh, mm-hmm. You ended your career, Terry, um, with 19 caps and seven goals. And you actually played in one of the group matches in that year. We won the World Cup against Mexico. And, of course, that was your last ever match for England, which you, you didn't have at the time. But how much was you disappointed that you didn't actually feature in the actual World Cup final itself, Terry? Well, I'm not sure what the plans were originally from, from team selection. Alan Ball, the great Alan Ball. He played in the first game against Uruguay, and we couldn't break them down, as you're probably aware. We, we drew nil-nil. And uh, I was selected for the second game against Mexico. I think he felt that he needed a little bit, maybe a little bit more width from, I don't think John Kelly played down the left-hand side, the Man United player at the time. I think he played down the left. So um, we had two wide players, and we obviously the, the attempt was to try and get behind them to create things and... As it turned out, we, we won two nils, which was, you know, on the day, looked, looked to be pretty comfortable. Uh, but what people forget was that I was concussed. Uh, if you ever look at the game, you see I get headed in the back of the head. And I can't remember anything about the game whatsoever. And only woke up on the, on the treatment table after the game. No substitutes, of course. So I played all the game. I, mean, I didn't feel unwell or anything. I just... But, but I was concussed, which obviously was a problem. I never gave it a second thought why I never played anymore, except the fact that I was injured. Alf was very strict about injuries. You know, he wouldn't select if he thought an injury was going to affect your performance. Although I was fine after two or three days, I trained and everything was fine. And um, it was only what, uh, not that long ago, a few years ago back, maybe, um, somebody said to Ray Wilson, who talked to me, he said, well, he said, we always wondered, if Terry Payne hadn't got concussed, would he have played on? In other words, would I have been selected for further games? And I never gave it a thought. I thought Alpha thought, right, Uruguay, you know, difficult, nil-nil, bring Terry in, blah, blah, revert back to Allen and, and to play it. And he changed John Kelly, as you know, and also brought Ian Callahan in down the right-hand side for a game as well. But I think the plan also was also to bring in Martin Peters, and Allen as a midfield where hence we got the 4-3-3. And I just thought that was a plan that he had and which he stuck to. Now, I've no reason to believe that's the absolute truth. It was just the, the feeling that I had that he had this plan. How we were going to set up with the different teams and the teams that he was going to select. And, that, and that's how it panned out. But I never thought the fact that if I hadn't been injured, would I have got another game? I never, I never even gave that a thought until it was brought up. By, I think it was Ray Wilson was doing some kind of interview, he mentioned that. In those days, incredibly, it was only the 11 players on the pitch at the end of the game that were given winners' medals. Indeed, it would take 43 years to receive a well-deserved winners' medal after a long-term FA-led campaign to encourage FIFA to issue these medals to all members of the squad. The then Prime Minister, Gordon Brown, awarded you your medal and the remaining members of your squad in June 2009. Now, that must have been worth the wait, Terry. <laughs> Yeah, that was brilliant. I mean, you know, it was, I think it was a campaign by one of the newspapers, I think, that set it all up. And quite rightly so. I mean, you can't play in a competition or be part of a competition and not get rewarded, you know, by just 11 players. I mean, they tell me the guy who sweeps in the dressing room gets one there as well. I'm not sure if that's right. But, uh, 
But, you know, it, it, was, it was something that needed to be done. It was a great occasion. It was even better in, in some ways, you know, the fact that we all got together, as, as we used to call us the reserve team, to go to number 10, which was, a, you know, which was special in its own way, and to receive the medal and, um, and be rewarded as being part and parcel of, of that team. It was, it was great. Even Jimmy Greaves came along to, to get it as well, uh, which was nice to see, because, as you know, Jimmy had, had sort of departed um, for the final, hadn't been, been present, had gone home. So, uh, but it was lovely, you know, it was a gr- great occasion. And it was an even better occasion, the World Cup in Germany, that FIFA invited all the winning World Cup squads from back 1930-odd, whoever was living from then, you know, invited all the winning squads. They invited us all to come to Germany, to the FIFA c- Congress, and um, have been looked after brilliantly there. Um, you know, every team saw some of the, the great players that have performed, they were all there and uh, to be presented on stage, you know, that, that was something really special as well. So, and uh, obviously to meet up with all the squad again and uh, be part and parcel of that in Germany was again very special. And FIFA, you know, really, um, really did us play really. And uh, I don't think it's happened since, but it certainly happened then. And um, I was certainly more than pleased to go to Germany and meet up with everybody and be part and parcel of the 2006 uh, World Cup. So that was a bit special. You'd eventually retire at the end of the 1977 season after 20 years as a professional footballer and having made a combined 919 senior appearances for both Saints and Hereford, scoring an impressive 191 goals and being a member of the only England team ever to win a Football World Cup. So when you reflect back on your career as a whole, Terry, it was truly Roy the Rover stuff, wasn't it? Yes, it was. And, I mean, that's really just 900 and some of the games it was. I just wonder how many games I actually played. If you take in all the... Games that went on tour, pre-season, end of season. Uh, how many games, on you know, the friendlies that we played as well, which obviously not competitive games, I understand that. But I reckon, I reckon I'll have broke the thousand mark if you put all those together. And I suppose if you threw in the England games under 23s and the football league games as well, I would have had to have played over a thousand games, I think. So, yeah, it's a record that I'm really, really pleased with. And when you look back on your career, you can't wish for anything better than that, can you, really? I mean, it's a, it's a lot of games and um, a lot of miles that are run and um, a few honours on the way as well. And, and that's at the end of the day when you look back. It's, uh, well, certainly in our day, that was what it was all about. Obviously, you know, the money is so different these days. We understand that. And um, the money that's poured into the game now from the... Television. I mean, it's a, it's just a different ball game. I remember Ted giving us a pound note to get, take five or six of the lads to pictures, and coming back, the cost of going to the pictures for us was nineteen uh, shillings and six pence, and he waited for the sixpence change. Always said to me, "Always look after your, your club's money as if it was your own." <laughs> OK, just to end on a bit of Saints stuff, before we get some Saints Archive member questions, Terry, we know you've been living in Johannesburg, South Africa now for many years, working on TV there as a Premier League pundit. But in 2013, you became honorary president of Saints, a role in which you act as club ambassador for both home and away. How much did that role mean to you when presented with it? And still does, no doubt. I mean, you've come sort of full circle on this, haven't you? You started off with the club and you've ended up at the club. Yeah, it was a lovely gesture on part of the club to invite me to be the honorary president and you know I look back a little bit on it and, and think well Ted Bates did the same you know he started there as a, a player and ended up as president didn't he so yeah. it's an honor you know it's an honor that I hold very dearly um I, I appreciate what the club has done and um what I'm really pleased about also is that now we've got you know true ambassadors in the club Matthew Letizio, Francis Benali quite rightly now we've got Larry McBenemy on board as well which I think that should have happened a long time ago anyhow you know I think the club are looking you know, to the future and what it means to have ex-players in and around the club um, I think that all goes well for the club and the way and where they're going you know to be presented as the, the honorary and be able to come over uh, and do uh, you know the player of the year award the president's player of the year award has, has been very very nice as well and been well received and well looked after whenever I have come over. So, again, almost typical of the club that I remember, as I was telling you before about all the, you know, being a family. 
it's, it's nice to have that um, that kind of feeling uh, at the club, and uh, I think it's important. I know things have changed. I know sort of with the, with the players now, it's a lot more difficult with the fans to be with players as as they used to be in my day when we used to go to supporters clubs and, and meet to mingle with the supporters and being asked questions and just as if it was one big family. I know all that's changed. I understand that. But it's still lovely to be part and parcel of the club you know, and to be its honorary president. Now we're going to look back to a few of the questions uh, posed by our members at Saints Archive. So what we do is probably seen, uh, we give an opportunity for them to ask. Then what we do is we pick sort of one or two of the best ones for you. So first of all, uh, we've got Paddy okay. Maxwell. He mentions that Derek Reeve had scored a prolific amount of goals. Uh, where in the 1959-60 season, he managed to do 39 goals, which remains a record today for the club. What are your memories of Derek? Well, first of all, he was a, he was a really, really good guy. A lovely, lovely man. Derek, quick, aggressive. Uh, remember, it was the third division, of course. And again, he, he was established as our centre forward as I was coming through. Um, but a prolific scorer, and possibly the chances we made. You know, it's often said that Derek missed more than he scored, but he still scored 39, as you quite rightly said, it's still a, a, a club record. He was one of the nicest guys you could ever meet. Really, really gained the worth. And, uh, but as his record proves, you know, like everything else, sometimes when, when you start to make progress as a team and you move up divisions, sometimes that division catches up with you. And I didn't really understand what the professional game was about in the early days. I just played. I didn't understand that you could come in one day and the guy who you've been stripped next to for the last sort of five or six months, he's gone. What do you mean gone? Well, he's been transferred. You know, that was all very, very strange to me. So that was the first thing I learned about about the professional game. That You know, I was still playing it as an amateur and enjoying it and, and being involved with the team. You know, I didn't look on people coming and going, but that's how it, that's how it turned out. But, but Derek really was, was an outstanding player at that level and I think his goals proved it. Uh, Steve Humphreys would also like to know who were the best two players you've ever played with? Uh, is that club wise or internationally? I, I think he means any time at all in your career. <laughs> oh, that's, that's a hard one. I mean, <laughs> I think when you, you get so many top players at international level, don't you? But I think if we stayed on club level, I think that, you know, with Southampton, we, we obviously had some outstanding strikers, obviously. You can't really put one above the other because different times, different eras, different leagues. But I have a huge, huge respect for George O'Brien, who sadly just just passed away not so long ago. Never quite thought he got the credits that he, he really deserved with his goal scoring. He's probably, of all the, the finishers, he was probably the most clinical. You know, George was very sharp in and around the box and scored a lot of goals, a lot of important goals for him. And I've been quite friendly with him for, for quite a while. Ron Davis, we've already spoke about. Nobody better than Ron. But then we had an emerging Martin Chivers, didn't we? Um, we probably didn't see the best of Martin until he went to Tottenham. But he always looked as if he was going to be, you know, a top, top player. And then, But I think possibly my favourite of all would have been Mick Shannon, I think. We had this telepathy as a youngster. He was He was lovely and wild and... You know, spoke his mind as a youngster. He, he really, he was really into it, and uh, sometimes out of place. But that was that was Mick, and he's never changed from that. But I had just just had this telepathy with him, and we had this great understanding. Um, you know, I knew where he was going to run. I didn't even have to look. I could play it in there, and know that he was going to be on the end of it. So, of all of them, probably Mick Shannon would have been my top player that, that I that I enjoyed. But, but those others I've mentioned really deserve a mention as well. I've got a question from Michael Graham here, which is a good one. Um, I'm not sure why he's picked the number he has, but he asks, who were the three most difficult left-backs you've played against? Well, the most difficult I played against would, have, would undoubtedly have been, and I didn't play against him too often, grateful for that, was Ray Wilson, eventually Huddersfield, and then Everton left-back in the England left-back in the World Cup in 66. I mean, Ray was so quick. You were always planning and you know, the ways to, to beat him. It, what you, you certainly weren't going to beat him with any kind of pace. You you had to plan your game against him. And he used to get nice and tight and, you know, he used to usher you away from, from danger. 
So possibly from a left back point of view, he automatically springs to mind. Funny enough, yeah. they put a Rodriguez when he played for Cardiff. I always found it very difficult to play against him. So difficult, in fact, and I'm talking way back now, long before he came to the club, I told Ted, I said, hey, if you can get him, he's the hardest player, you know, most difficult player I've played against. So, yeah, Peter Rodriguez is another difficult opponent. But as I said, uh, many, many, many years ago, I, I said to Ted, if you get a chance, you ought to sign him. So I already put him, you know, marked him down as a, a, a more difficult opponent. So, you know, all players, they, they all give you some kind of problems, but the problems, you, you've got to overcome them, as simple as that, really. But th- those two automatically spring to mind. There are plenty more. Well, I'm, no, I'm sure we could talk for hours, Terry, but uh, I just thought a topical question to end with, because um, six months or so ago, most of us had no idea what the word coronavirus was or meant, but I think it's uh, impacting all of our lives across the world. From a footballing point of view, Terry, we've seen Holland um, cancel their league down without any winners, etc. France have then followed suit. We know you're actively involved in working and talking about the Premier League, so I just wonder what your view was on what should happen with the Premier League in England, because whilst decisions are no doubt difficult, they do seem to be a little bit more revenue-driven here at the moment. So do you think that they should try and get it back as quickly as possible and sort of lift morale of all of us that are in lockdown over here? Or do you think it's, it makes sense to maybe cancel this season, get everyone fit and healthy across the country, reduce the number of cases, and then maybe bring it back from the start of next year? Yeah, as, as you quite rightly said, it's, it's a terrible, terrible virus that's going around and uh, it's impacted on all our lives quite quite rightly. Um, and, it's, and it is a difficult one to know exactly where you go as far as the premiership is concerned. I think the word you use really financially, I think they really want to try and get the premiership finished mm. if they possibly can. I mean, without the finances of the television, I mean, clubs are going to be in big trouble. So, uh, you know, I really would like to see the, the season finished, but when and where uh, is it going to happen? And that's the biggest conundrum they've got you know what's going to happen with this virus when's it going to finish or peak or whatever so decisions have got to be made and whatever decision is going to be made it's not going to suit some clubs and certainly as far as as we said the finances are concerned the tv companies etc i just don't know what the answer is there i really don't it's it's very 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 difficult and i know some decisions have been made by some you know uh, leagues to cancel and and uh, wipe out the season um, but I'd certainly love the Premiership to, to be finished, and I'm not sure what that decision is going to be. Even if it carried into June, July, I'd rather have a late start for next season, if you like, and get this season finished. But those decisions are going to be very, very difficult for those in charge, and the clubs have got to make, you know, the 20 Premiership clubs have got to make that decision sooner or later. And at the moment, as I said, the may be said that they've got to make a decision by the 25th of May, there's going to be a lot of talking. Maybe we'll see behind closed doors. Maybe we'll see one venue used for two or three games at a time. Um, they're talking about FIFA. They're talking about using more substitutes so that you spread the load. But the problem with all of it is if, if one of them happens to go down with it, you know, and, and one of the players and then takes it home to his family, blah, blah, blah. So there's all those decisions that have got to be made and they're not going to be easy. And I, I would like to make that decision, I've got to be honest. Yeah, no, it'll be an interesting one, won't it? I think uh, from a Saints point of view, if it means removing the uh, Leicester home game from the records forever, that's maybe not a bad thing, but uh, there we go. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but, but, but look, Terry, I mean, it's been an absolute honour for the three of us to have you on um, Total Recall. Thanks so much for taking the time to join us for you know all the continued great work you do for the club as president and uh, for allowing us to speak with such a, a Saints legend. Well, that's very, very kind and very kind of you to think about me and uh, only a pleasure. I hope we'll have some fun with what you've taken, what you've recorded. And um, and I'd just like, you know, to thank you for having the opportunity to do that and just hope that, you know, once the virus clears, we can get on with this great game and everybody comes through it safely. That's been Total Recall with Southampton legend Terry Payne, MBE.